Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Jody, and I'm with Medicine Hat Family Service and I'm going to be talking today about dating as a mature adult, exploring new relationships after the loss of a spouse. And the term loss of a spouse today will cover both losing a spouse through death and losing a spouse through a divorce. So I just thought we'd start off with a quote. So you know, the man of my dreams might walk around the corner tomorrow. I'm older and wiser, and I think I'd make a great girlfriend. I live in the realm of romantic possibility. So Stevie Nicks said that. And I thought, well, maybe some of you guys are starting to feel that you're living in the realm of romantic possibility. Maybe you're, you're out of some of the process of grieving your spouse, and maybe just that possibility is starting to feel exciting for you and not too intimidating, or maybe it's still feeling really intimidating. And that's why we're here to talk about the very wide range of experiences that we can have when we find ourselves newly single. So before we can start to move on emotionally and physically and put ourselves out there, we do need to deal with the loss of the spouse. So um, Warden wrote mainly about um, loss of a spouse or loss of someone through death, but I'm gonna weave in some of that, how it can match up with what Warden explained about losing a spouse through death and also losing a spouse through divorce because there is some overlap in those experiences. So Warden wrote about the tasks involved in mourning the loss of a loved one. He didn't write about a stage model or a phase model. He thought of it more as tasks. And the reasoning for the tasks is that you can be working on some of the first tasks and some of the second tasks and moving back and forth between them, whereas if you're in a stage, it's more like going up steps, so there's not as much movement in those types of models. So we're gonna talk about the tasks, the things we need to do to, to process the loss, okay? So defining grief, mourning, and bereavement. So this is mainly focused on losing a, a partner through death. But with divorce, we also can experience quite a bit of grief. We can be in mourning over the loss of that relationship, especially if it was unexpected. Um, so Warden used the term grief to indicate the experience of one who has lost a loved one to death. So the grief is the experience. He explained mourning is the process that we go through um, as we begin to adapt to the death of that person. And then there's also the term bereavement that gets used. And bereavement defines the loss to which the person is trying to adapt. Okay? And so Warden's tasks of mourning, so going through the process of um, grieving the person that we've lost. Um, task one, accept the reality of the loss. Task two, to process the pain of the grief. Three is to adjust to the world without the deceased or without your um, partner, your ex-partner. And then four is to find an enduring connection with the deceased in the midst of embarking on a new life. And in the case of divorce, I'll talk a bit more about this because we're gonna talk about all these tasks a little bit more in detail in the coming slides. But with, um, with divorce, maybe it's not finding necessarily an enduring connection, but a way of relating to each other and dealing maybe with family events, those types of things, how are you gonna handle it? So maybe you're not necessarily communicating with them and deciding how your connection is gonna be. Maybe there isn't a lot of communication, but it's finding, um, how negotiating how that relationship is gonna look for you guys when you do have shared children, grandchildren. What, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna do things? Are you just gonna pick one event and the other, your ex gets the other event? What does that look like? So for task one, to accept the reality of the loss, um, shock is, is the first experience um, or the first um, initial stage, usually when, someone ha when we find out that our loved one has passed. Um, so when someone dies, even if the death is expected, there is always a sense that it hasn't happened. And in the case of divorce, um, if you didn't, um, feel like it was coming, if you weren't planning it for years, if you were on the other side of things where you didn't want it, you were hoping things were getting better, or you didn't see it coming at all, you can also be experiencing this unreality, this isn't really happening. And, and so the first task is to accept that. 
Um, Borden explained that part of the acceptance of this reality is coming to believe that the reunion is impossible, at least in this life, okay? And he also noted that acceptance of the reality of the lost takes time, since it involves not only intellectually knowing that that, um, that person isn't in our lives anymore, it's also the emotional aspect, which I think personally takes quite a bit longer to, to go through the emotional aspect of that. Okay, so task two is to process the pain of the grief. So in the case of divorce, if, if it was a very um, unhappy relationship for you, perhaps you might not f f get the sense that you have as much pain and grief around that, but there are gonna be other emotions that you could be processing, okay? So it could be the anger, it could be the hurt, maybe there was abuse involved, so getting healed from that. Um, in the case of losing a spouse through death, um, it is necessary to acknowledge and work through the literal physical, emotional, and behavioral pain that many people experience with, associated with the loss. So in the case of divorce, there's still going to be the physical, emotional, and behavioral aspects that to process through, even if you really wanted that divorce and even though you have that sense of freedom after you've ended that relationship. And if the pain of grief is not processed, or if the pain of divorce or the relationship is not processed, it can manifest itself through physical symptoms or some form of aberrant behavior, okay? So if we don't um, start to process some of the pain that we've, we're dealing with, that emotional pain, sometimes we can turn to numbing um, mechanisms. Maybe it's working a lot or keeping ourselves overly busy. Maybe it's never being home, just always staying out of the home. It could be drinking to numb out the pain or, or taking um, over the counter or prescription medication or different, different ways. So running from um, our emotional hurt, um, it's not really possible. We're just gonna stuff it if we're numbing it. But it's also important to notice, to note that like, you can't deal with all of it all at once and just say, I just want this over with, I'm just gonna plunge into it because then we can overwhelm and flood ourselves. So we need to give ourselves the time to do this and also make sure we get the right supports to do this as well. And that can come in the form of a good counselor, a support group, um, close friends and family who are very supportive if you have that, um, talking to your family doctor. There's so many different ways that we can build up our support. And then, so dealing with the loss of a spouse due to divorce, so some marriages, as we all know, end suddenly, while others seem to fall apart over a long period of time. So no matter what the cause, if your marriage fails, you're likely to feel a whole range of intense emotions. And some of those can include sadness, anger, hurt, fear of an uncertain future, um, loneliness, and then also confusion over all the many decisions to make. Um, and a sense of failure at your lost plans and dreams, okay? And so some feelings associated with grief. So these are all feelings that are part of a typical grief experience, okay? So sadness, anger, guilt, and self-reproach. Um, maybe guilt, maybe it wasn't the best relationship that we had with our partner, and then, and then they passed away suddenly and we didn't get to fix things up the way we would have liked to have ended things or had a more positive um, communication with them. Anxiety, loneliness, fatigue, helplessness, shock, yearning, emancipation, so feeling a sense of freedom, especially if um, your par partner or spouse was suffering a lot before they passed away. You can, be, you can have the sense of relief that they, they're free from that suffering. Or in the case of divorce, um, if it was um, an unhealthy relationship, you can also have that feeling of, oh, I'm finally free from that relief as well, and or numbness. Okay, so thoughts that can occur. So we just talked about the feelings. Now we're going to talk about the thoughts that we could be um, addressing as we're going into task two. Might be having some disbelief, confusion, preoccupation with the person and the situation, a uh, sense of presence, maybe still feeling them around. And that's, this is all very, very typical and normal aspects of this experience of losing someone. And even hallucinations, the visual and auditory type, okay? If, if they keep continuing or you start to feel concerned about them, if it's been going on for a while, please talk to somebody um, in the helping profession, probably your family doctor or, or someone else, a psychologist, if you have one. 
And so then there's thoughts, behaviors, and feelings. So this is the behaviors related to experiencing grief. Might experience sleep disturbances. This is pretty normal. Appetite disturbances, okay, not feeling like eating. Absent-minded behavior, okay, because of the emotional um, burden that you're carrying, it's hard for our brains to use the other part, our thinking rational part. So we're going to have some of that absent-minded behavior. You have social withdrawal, dreams of the deceased um, or your ex, avoiding reminders of them. Maybe you always ate at the same restaurant or something. Searching and calling out, sighing. So that's uh, releasing some of that tension when we're doing the sighing. Maybe we've been holding our breath and not knowing it. So some restless hyperactivity, crying, visiting places or carrying objects that remind the survivor of the deceased or and or treasuring objects that belong to the deceased. Okay, so this is all normal and just processing through some of this. So grief and depression. So if you found yourself newly divorced or just found out that your spouse is leaving you or if you've just lost your spouse um, or it's happened for a while but you might wonder am I, is this, am I still grieving or have I actually moved into um, experiencing depression? Okay, so what Warden explained is true, it is true that grief looks very much like depression because we have much lower um, energy levels and everything. But, and it is also true that um, grieving may develop into full-blown depression. So there's quite a bit of overlap with those experiences and then grieving can turn into depression. So it's important to know that. But he explained that the main differences between grief and depression are that um, in depression and grief, we might have the classic symptoms of sleep disturbances, not feeling like eating or appetite disturbances, intense sadness. However, with the grief, there is not the loss of self-esteem. So that's an important way to be able to tell um, for you if you're wondering. I, but if you're still feeling some, that's not the only way. So if you are feeling like some concern that you have had a low mood for quite some time, please talk to someone um, your family doctor or counselor, okay, just to so they can let you, help you to figure out if it is actually still in the grieving process or if you're um, experiencing depression. So, yeah, so loss of self esteem can be a sign that you've moved into depression. So, task three involves adjusting to the world without the deceased or adjusting to the world without your ex partner, okay? So no matter how that relationship has ended, we still have to make these adjustments. And so there's these three types that Warden identified. So we can have external adjustments. And so those involve how the death or divorce affects one's everyday functioning in the world. So it's, it's, it's kind of like the nuts and bolts of living. Maybe, yeah, maybe your um, spouse always drove you around to the grocery store, so you have to figure out how am I going to get to the grocery store now? Do I have a friend who will drive me? How is that? What is that going to look like? So that was, those are some of the external adjustments that we deal with in task three. And that's where task three and task one and two can have some overlap, right? Because almost immediately we have to start dealing with a little bit of these external adjustments or quite a few of them um, in planning out how we're going to live our lives. And that can feel quite overwhelming, especially in task one when we're in the early stages. So internal adjustments come a little bit, come on as well, and those address how the death or divorce affects our sense of self. How does that affect how I think about myself? How I feel about myself? What's going on for me? Because that can really change, especially with this type of major um, life event. And then thirdly, Warden wrote about the spiritual adjustments that involve coming to understand how the death or divorce affects one's beliefs, values, and assumptions about the world. So when we have a major change in our lives, a lot of the time at some point we can start to reevaluate and say, hey, what, what has changed for me now based on this experience? Um, maybe you feel differently about doctors now or the, our healthcare system after that experience or maybe the legal system. Maybe you have some new insights and um, have different assumptions about the world. Okay, so it's really, really important during this time is self-care, taking good care of yourself. And it can be hard to think about this, but it's also really good to look at the reminders to stay healthy. So try to eat regularly, try to get your sleep, try not to stay up late worrying. If you're having a hard time sleeping, talk to somebody about that. Um, also try to get regular exercise that can help with dealing with the stress of the situation. Um, 
learn some other methods for coping with stress other than just exercise and getting enough sleep. Um, there can be a, a number of books that are out there. Volunteering, yeah, connecting with others can be really important and helpful. And then there's also some relaxation techniques that you could try out as well, either with the help of a counselor in a group setting that they could talk to you about, um, or your family doctor even, or bookstores, library. And then keep in mind this old saying. So this is based on um, uh, Canadian Mental Health Association's uh, website on dealing with separation and divorce, but I think this also applies to when you're dealing with the death of a loved one. Um, take one day at a time. So when unexpected problems and other thing, feelings um, surface, just focus down on what do I need to do today or what do I need to do this hour or what do I need to do for the next three minutes if it's really overwhelming to think that far ahead and just take it in the, the smallest units that you can tolerate or you don't need to plan out the next year of your life. Don't put that type of pressure on yourself. So if you just need to think about what you need to do for the next minute, then just do that. Or if you just need to be in the present moment, then just do that, okay? And um, that will help to manage all of this overwhelming sense of feelings and flooding that you might be experiencing. And then try to put off making major decisions as well until your life has become more settled, okay? Making decisions when we're really highly emotional might not be the same decisions that we would make if we um, had some more time to process through what we're going through and make, make different plans. Um, so might not, we might not make the same decisions because our energy levels are different, our focus is different. So some of the decisions you might want to put off making is um, making a major career change, moving, um, going back to school, different things like that, or starting to date. So some other self-care strategies. Talk to someone you trust, okay? So that really can be important, even if it's just one person a friend, a family member. Maybe this is a new friend that you just happened to meet in some, some setting that, that has had gone through a similar experience. Maybe they're newly divorced or they've gone through a divorce or the death of a spouse. They can, might be some of the best people to offer support. Um, keep the lines of communication open with your family and friends. What, so some of this is figuring out the boundaries of what's going to work for you and what isn't. Um, for example, in the divorce situation, if you find... Um, Christmas is being held at one of your children's houses, but you don't want to um, see, you're not ready yet to see your ex-partner, so then f keep those lines of communication open, you know, let your daughter know it's very important for you to see her during the Christmas season, but maybe that specific day, the family meal all together, you're not ready to deal with that, and um, just, just keep communicating with them so then they can help and offer you support, hopefully. And then get professional help when you need it. If you're going through a divorce, um, definitely consult, consider consulting a lawyer so you can know what your rights are. Um, if you're experiencing emotional stress, don't put off talking to your family doctor. Even if you're not sure that you do need some help, just even talking about it with someone can be really helpful. Or talk to your counselor. Um, just talking about it can make a big difference, even if you decide you know, medication isn't the right thing for you, or maybe just going for a few counseling sessions, even that can be really helpful. Um, maybe they can connect you in with a support group or something like that. That might be more of what you're looking for. And then also look for support in your community. So volunteering, um, when you have the energy to get out of the house to start doing some of that, maybe taking a workshop um, or just helping others um, can be really helpful too. And then a little more on self-care. So just allow yourself the time you need to heal. I'm going to say this a few more times throughout this presentation. So your family and friends might encourage you to cheer up and get on with life before you are ready. And that can be because they, it hurts them. They're hurting with you and for you to see you suffering. Um, but it's really important to know that you need to take that time, whatever that time is, that you need to heal, okay? And then um, losing a marriage, no matter how difficult that relationship may have been, or a partnership, or whatever it, that relationship was, can still cause wounds, and you will need time to grieve that. So give yourself quiet times alone. Don't overschedule yourself and run yourself down. Um, so you can think, cry, or simply just be by yourself, okay? And so task four, um, finding an enduring connection with the deceased in the midst 
of embarking on a new life. So for some of you in this room, you might already be feeling like you're working on some of task four. Um, still keeping up that connection with, with your partner who's passed away, but then also feeling like you have this new life that you're also starting to, to walk into. Um, in, the, in the case of if you're newly divorced, um, Maybe it's not finding an enduring connection, but negotiating what type of the connection you do have with this person and with your fa shared family members and negotiating how all that will work out. Um, so this task involves finding an appropriate place for the dead person in one's emotional life, um, a place that will enable the survivor to go on living effectively in the world. So what does it mean, this task? Um, we can continue to have what we have lost. That is a continuing, albeit transformed, love for the deceased. And I'll just go through this um, for, with um, the scenario of having a partner who's passed away. So we have not truly lost our years of living with our deceased partner or our memories. We still have all of that. Nor have we lost their influences. Sometimes, you know, you can still hear or you know what they would be saying to you, right? And that can be very comforting. We haven't lost that. Um, the inspirations, the values, and the meanings that their lives brought to us. Okay, so we can still hold on to that. Um, we can actively incorporate these into new patterns of living that include the transformed but abiding relationship, okay, with those we have cared about and loved. So that's what this really means, is keeping up that connection with the, with our pers the person we love who's passed away, but also um, going out and trying new things and having this, this new different life. Um, in the case of with divorce, um, you know, we can get to the point where we're, we can be thankful maybe for some of what the relation, the positives in the relationships are for. Maybe there weren't very many positives, but we can also be maybe at some point, not that you have to, but you might get to that point where you can be thankful for what you learned from that situation. Even though there was a lot of pain and suffering involved in that, you might find that there's some times where you're like, you know, at least I learned, I learned this from this situation. And we can have some gratitude for that. Um, or it can just mean um, getting to a healthier place and having those boundaries set where they can't hurt us anymore and being thankful that we can do that. All right, so we're just gonna take a little break right now and we're gonna have some off-camera discussion, um, if you like. Welcome back, I hope you had a good break. So now we're gonna start talking a bit about a future focus. We've been talking about the past and working through the grief and the feelings associated with the death or divorce, the loss of a loved one, a partner, a spouse. Um, so now we're gonna talk about, well, thinking about dating. Am I ready? What's, what, is this something I wanna try out? What is it like? What's it gonna be like? So an important point to note is that getting older doesn't mean that our need for closeness and companionship goes away. We're, we're all social beings from the time we're born until the time we pass away. So we, we always need, are needing and wanting that connection with others. Um, many people 50s, in their 50s, 60s and older find themselves newly single. So it's not unusual to find yourself newly single. It can just feel very different um, to adjust to this new phase. And, or maybe you're just simply deciding it's time to find a partner. Maybe you've been single for a long time and you've just decided, I think I, think I might want to try this dating thing out. So whether you're separated or bereaved, or if you've been single for some time, it's never too late to start a new relationship. Okay? And it's not unusual to feel lonely, especially if you've just lost a partner. So that's a very normal aspect of that. Um, or if you've just decided to go your separate ways. So you may, might have more free time now. Maybe you've entered into retirement, um, changed jobs, and you have more time and energy that you want to invest into, your, into a future relationship or a potential relationship. And you want to share that with somebody. Or maybe you just miss having physical contact. So some factors to take into consideration. Um, so the thought of meeting someone new can feel daunting. It can feel pretty intimidating once we start thinking about trying out dating, especially if you've spent years or even decades in the same relationship 
or if you've been on your own for a long time. So that's okay to feel that way, all right? That's, pretty, that's a pretty normal part of that. Um, if you're newly single, it also means coming to terms with the end of your previous relationship and just making sure you've given yourself time to process their feelings. And the reason why I keep mentioning that and other sources that I looked at continue to mention that is that if we haven't processed a certain amount um, of our grief, of our feelings, task two, the um, warden's task two, is that we can be vulnerable. Um, we're not emotionally ready, so we can be more vulnerable if we meet somebody who does um, have not such good intentions. So um, if we're still really hurting, we might not be able to judge another person's character as well as if we've taken that time, done the healing and the grieving and worked through everything that we needed to work through and have built up our resilience. So that's why it's, it is really important, even though you might feel very lonely, um, and really maybe miss the physical aspect of a relationship. Um, by moving ahead too quickly, you might find that you um, end up in, a, in an abusive relationship or, or end up um, being manipulated by somebody um, just because of your heightened vulnerability. If you find that happens, and it does happen, okay, so um, there's no need to feel shame in that, but just work, work to get yourself out of that and um, Get the support that you need to get yourself um, into that healthier place and out of that situation and then just take that opportunity as well just to do some more healing for yourself and sometimes we don't really know until we get out there oh i'm actually not ready for dating or you know sometimes we don't know till we try so when is it too soon to start dating after the death of a partner. I'm also gonna talk about after divorce, but first we're gonna start after the death of a partner. So if your partner was dying for a long time, the chances are that you did a lot of the grieving and mourning before he or she actually died. That may or may not be the case. Everybody is different, but that could be your situation. Um, you might feel more ready to, to, for a new life with someone than someone else whose spouse has died suddenly or whose partner died suddenly. Um, in cases of a lengthy terminal illness, it's not unusual for a new relationship to blossom even before the partner has passed away or died. Um, it could be an emotional connection that you had with someone. It's not necessarily physical, but it could have been. And, um, and although this new relationship can have been a great comfort during that very difficult time in your life. You can also experience some guilt about that, and that's not unusual either, okay? So if you're experiencing a lot of guilt and really struggling with that heavy burden after your, par your partner or spouse has passed away, you know, go get the help that, that you need. Don't suffer with that, okay? Um, go find a counselor that you can trust or talk to your family doctor and see what resources they can point you towards. And there are no absolutes when it comes to people's feelings. So um, your, your partner might have passed away 10 years ago and you still don't feel ready to date, that's okay. Um, your partner may have passed away three or four months ago and you do feel ready to, to start trying to make connections with other people, okay? Everybody is different, every situation is different, every relationship is different. So when is it too soon to start dating after divorce? Um, if you're divorced or just ended a long-term relationship, your well-meaning friends and relatives um, might encourage you to start dating again soon, but how will you know when you're ready? So maybe your children do want you to start dating, but you just don't feel ready, or maybe you're dealing with the exact opposite, where you know, your family members um, are very judgmental about you wanting to date or even have friendships at this point. So negotiating that. And it can widely vary from person to person, um, says Dr. Sills. And she wrote a book um, called Getting Naked Again, Dating Romance, Sex and Love When You've Been Divorced, Widowed, Dumped, or Distracted. So she, she covered everything there. So I, I haven't personally read this book, but it sounds interesting to me. Um, what she says is everyone ends a relationship by grieving the emotional investment. So whatever type of relationship it was and however it ended, we need to have that grieving, the emotional investment that we put into it. 
Okay? For some people that happens before they move out. Maybe you were planning your divorce for years, maybe decades. Um, and others are still emotionally married after the divorce is final. Okay? And it's all just very, very different for every one of us. So here are five tips um, about how to decide if you're ready to date. So first, go by your feelings, okay? Don't let other people tell you what you should or shouldn't be feeling or doing, okay? You need to, you're in charge of yourself, you need to make your decisions about what's best for you. So some people are ready to start dating after two months, others might need years, and that's okay. It's important to experience the emotions associated with the divorce or with the death of your partner. And then give yourself a little time to think, a little time to grieve, a little opportunity to find someone else. Just, just let things happen more naturally instead of just pushing for it. So the tip number two, ready for being ready or not, the X factor, okay? So if you are still thinking about what your ex is doing or who he's dating or she's dating, you are too distracted to be in a healthy relationship or even begin a healthy relationship, okay? So if, if you're still focused on someone else, it's not fair to start something new. Okay, so that means there's still some emotions or some um, aspects of that relationship you need to process, okay? As hard as it might be, that's, it's important to do that for your own good and well-being. Some people date and even marry to try to prove something to an ex. Okay, that is not a good reason to put yourself out there. Mainly because you're not helping yourself. You're not genuinely in this relationship, the new relationship. So you wouldn't want to date somebody or marry someone who's still tangled up with an ex emotionally, right? They're just not putting into that relationship um, in, a, in a full way. So why offer that to someone else? Number three, you could ask yourself, are you open to new experiences? Okay, that can be a sign that, that you might be ready if you're open to new experiences. So if you were in a committed um, relationship for a long time, the idea of beginning a new romance might seem scary. Um, if you've recently tried other activities that bring you out of your comfort zone, you might be ready to date. So when we start dating, we're gonna be moving out of our comfort zone. We're gonna be moving out of what we know and to trying something different. And that's why it's important to do this next point is have you done something that's an affirmation of yourself and your life? Maybe make a new, made, have you made a new friend? Have you started a new sport or gone back to a sport that you haven't done for a long time that you used to enjoy? You've gotten a haircut. It's not just the superficial aspect, but what have you done that's good for yourself? Um, you open your heart to new relationships when you're resilient enough to endure the minuses of dating to get the pluses. Okay, so we need by affirming ourselves, by taking care of ourselves, by doing things that feel good for ourselves, we're building up our resilience. And then we have more energy and we have better judgment of starting into a new relationship or starting into trying out the dating scene. And that's really important. So we want to build up our resilience so that we can have that energy that it's going to take to meet new people and try new things. Number four, so still preparing yourself and asking yourself, have you accepted yourself as an individual? This is really important. So your identity has nothing to do with your dating status, with your marital status, okay? Rather than jumping into a new relationship to avoid being alone, give yourself a chance to explore life on your own terms. Get to know yourself. What do you like? What don't you like? What didn't you know about yourself? What's, what surprises you? And also you can't heal unless you're on your own, okay? So there is that that need. Maybe you have felt on your own a lot in your previous relationship, okay? So that's not to say, you know, if three months or four months after that relationship has ended, maybe you do feel ready because you have done a lot of that healing even though you were physically still in the relationship, but it is important to have done that healing, okay, for your own um, benefit. And you need to find single friends to have a social life with. So just moving and just being in, focusing on just one person um, 
isn't, isn't very healthy. You need to have a wider social circle as well. Okay, and that's where you can get support and um, do fun things and just, and just learn more about yourself and enjoy life. So another thing to know or another tip to keep in mind if you're thinking about dating and to know if you're ready for dating is that things have changed since the last time you're dating. Um, especially if you've been in, just got out of a long-term relationship. So not only have you changed um, since you were last single, but so has your social life, your friends, your routines, everything, okay? So you might meet a new partner through a friend or by clicking with a mysterious stranger, or you might even want to try online dating. It is, a, it is, it is different. Um, so before you start looking for someone new, think carefully about whether you are ready for a new relationship, okay? So are you still, still looking back at um, the past or worrying about your ex or wondering what they're up to? Okay, just take an evaluation of that. That means you need to do some more processing. Have you built yourself up? Do you feel good about yourself? Have you done some of that work to build up your resiliency? Have you made some friends or kept up your friendships? Um, all of that are important things. So I, the, here's a quote from Gloria Allred, is I'm not interested in dating. I like being my own best, with my own best friend, me. Certain women, particularly older women, cannot believe I like going to a social event by myself, but I do. So what, sh what she's saying is that's what works for her. That is not a judgment on any of anyone else at all, but what she's saying is that she is her own best friend. And so have you become your own best friend? Because that is really, really important. That's an important aspect of starting a new relationship or starting the dating scene is um, having that self-respect for yourself. So more thinking. So once you start to feel ready and think about the possibility of a new relationship, um, preparing yourself physically as well as emotionally, so feeling good about yourself. Again, this is the resiliency aspect. Maybe it's a new hairstyle. It could really boost your confidence. Maybe if you put on some weight, you could start getting active and get fitter. So focusing on yourself for a bit. It can be great for your health and overall well-being. It doesn't always have to be a superficial thing. Maybe you need to just spend some time doing some activities that you really used to enjoy that you pushed off to the side. Um, swimming, dancing, badminton, yoga, anything like that can um, help you get out, make friends, and maybe meet some new people as well. And so there's many ways to meet new people. Um, when you start seeking a new relationship, you may be wondering where to begin. You may get friends and family giving you a lot of advice, especially if they um, are encouraging of you starting a new relationship. Um, or you may feel there is no one new to meet in your area or you aren't sure how, okay? So if you live in a smaller community, maybe you're not, maybe you feel like you know everybody and that may or may not be the case. Um, or if you're not sure how. So just be assured that there are lots of ways you can meet someone. Uh, one way is a new activity, hobby, maybe doing some volunteer work, um, trying out new activities. You might make new friends and have some fun. So here are some, here's a little list. I'm sure, I'm sure you guys know lots of them, but I just thought sometimes it helps just to see it written down. Maybe you're trying some of these already. So joining a walking group, maybe you like singing, join a choir, volunteering, taking a course. Maybe that's something you want to try out. Meeting people through mutual friends. Maybe signing up for online dating, maybe giving that a whirl, see how that goes. You can always try placing a personal ad or joining a book club. Just remember, it most likely won't happen overnight. And don't get disheartened if you don't meet the right person straight away, okay? It may take some time to meet someone, but staying active and remaining positive will actually help you enjoy this time, okay? So it can be challenging to get out there and to risk being vulnerable and getting to know other people and then not having it work out. So rushing or pushing yourself into a relationship with the wrong person can be much more difficult than learning to be on your own. Okay, I don't know if anyone has experienced that, but, it, but if you do find yourself in the relationship with the wrong person, and it's important to take that time to heal after that situation as well, okay? And so learning to be on our own is very, can be very important. So 
considerations. You might try dating and find out you have more to learn about yourself. Um, you might decide to take a break after dating a few people and just decide to focus on yourself and your own activities that you like. Or you might want to just keep dating casual. Um, you might just want to make friendships. And just make sure you are communicating this to the people that you are spending time with, especially if, if there's some people that you might be getting the message that they're interested in dating you. Um, just so you can keep um, open lines of communication and not have any false expectations um, with somebody, just to respect their time and their investment as well. So online dating. This can be an interesting area to dive into, but I thought we, we need to talk about it. I think it's happening a lot. So online dating is now one of actually the most common ways to meet somebody. And people over age 50 are becoming regular users of online dating sites. Okay. So some dating websites are aimed specifically at older people. So you can feel confident that you won't be out of place. Um, so one, one thing you, you might want to do is sign up. So some dating websites will let you register for free and other ones might ask for monthly or yearly fees. Um, there, you might have the option of signing up for free, but you won't be able to message or connect with anybody. You can just check out that website for free. And that might be a really good idea to do if you just want to, if you're just curious, right? You just maybe want to just check it out. Maybe you're not sold on it yet, but you just want to go in. So you could si sign up, create a profile for yourself, and then just browse around and see what, see what this online dating world is like. Um, but you might have to then pay subscription fees to send the messages or connect with others. Um, there are quite a few different websites. Or you could sign one, try one out, or you might want to try out a whole bunch all at once. It just depends on, on your style. So creating a profile. This can be a really important um, way of, of um, putting yourself out there and just seeing um, what, what who, you, who is interested in you and who you might be interested in. So it's important to be careful though, so other people will be able to see what you put up there, right? So you could put up a photo, write about your interests, just make sure you're comfortable with everything that you're putting up there of sharing with other people and having it being online. And then also indicate what type of person you might like to meet or what type of relationship you're looking for. Um, that can save a lot of time. Um, the more information you include, the easier it is for people to see what you are like and whether you might be a good match for them. All right. So to put up a photo online, you need to have a digital camera so, or a smartphone. And if you don't have one or you're not really sure how to do that, just ask a friend or maybe a relative if they can help. And then you can always try Googling it too um, and just see how do I upload a photo of myself with my iPhone or something like that. And sometimes Google is really great with some of those kind of how-to answers. Um, so getting started. So once you've set up your profile, you'll be able to, and if you've, there's a subscription fee paid that, you will be able to receive messages and send them to others. So maybe just take some time and send a few messages and see what happens if that's something you want to try. Um, and then it'll help you find out if you're interested in them. And maybe at some point you feel like you do want to have a phone call with this person after you message back and forth a few times. Maybe they're very, very interesting to you. So also you, it can be important to decide which websites to try. So there are a lot of dating websites. Some are even for specifically for people over 50. Um, and there can be all sorts of specialist dating websites as well. So maybe it's regarding, maybe you want to pick one that's um, with your religious faith or maybe based on your ethnicity, your sexual orientation, all of that. You can look into different types of websites as well. So you can pick what, what fits for your needs the best. Um, if you do decide to sign up, keep an open mind and a positive attitude. You're just curious. You're just trying this out, right? It's, it's not an all or none. Will people like me? Does this mean I'm unlikable if I don't hear from somebody? Um, it's just a an experiment, really. I think that can be a great way just to look at it. Um, and it can be exciting to find other people with similar interests um, and receive messages and emails from them and just start trying to connect. 
So just looking at it as a, an opportunity. And the main thing is to remember to be careful, okay? So there is no rush. Just take your time to be sure um, before you meet somebody or talk to them. Um, just, just go carefully with, with this whole thing because what people say online, as we all know, is not always true, okay? So if somebody is a fraud, the best way is to do it from behind a screen. One of the easiest ways is, right, it's way more anonymous. Much easier to lie when, when you're not in contact with that person on a day-to-day -day basis. So safe dating. So online dating is generally safe, all right? But you do need to exercise some common sense and some caution. And it can be easy to throw caution to the wind when you get caught up in the excitement, okay? And that, that's okay, but just remember, there are some basic safety precautions you should always take. So if you're arranging to meet someone for the first time, meet them in a public pay place, okay? This is just the same as going on a blind date or maybe even a little bit, you know them even less, right, than a blind date if somebody set you up with them. Um, so meet in a public place, make sure someone else in your life knows where you are. You can always check in with them before you go and meet this new person and check in afterwards just so they know you're okay. So you have that backup. Um, or you can have them call you or send you a text to check in with you at a certain point in that meeting to make sure you're okay. Don't accept a ride from the person or go home with them or take them to your home until you're sure about them, okay? So there are some, some incidences where it's not, really not safe to do that. So take your time to get to know someone. Go slowly, okay? Ask questions. Be curious. But, and then also remember to have fun too. So it's a good idea to speak to someone on the phone first just to get a little bit of a sense about them. It's a little bit more of a connection than just typing out text online, okay? Before you agree to meet them or maybe Skype a bit, right? You can see a little bit more about them. Um, and just make sure you keep do that in a public place and keep meeting in public places for a while till you're more sure about them, okay? And this can give you a better idea of their personality and whether you might be a good match. So online dating fraud, okay? So that can be something. Um, online dating fraud is on the rise. And one scam is where the new partner might try to get money. Um, maybe they'll tell you a story of hardship or ask for money to come and visit you, okay? Um, and there are also fraudsters who want to enter into relationships for immigration purposes to gain access to Canada. So just be aware of this, that, that there are, we know there are manipulative people out there. There's also manipulative people on the internet as well, okay? So just take some precautions so you don't fall for a scam. Be careful with your personal information. Never give your full name and address or other personal details to someone until you're sure you can trust them. Okay, and that takes time. Trust takes time. And then be aware of some warning signs. Um, if the conversation becomes personal very quickly, that can be a warning sign that this person doesn't have healthy boundaries, right? They're offering a whole lot of information about themselves, which may or may not be true in the um, effort to manipulate you into being trusting with them and to share your personal and private information, okay? So if someone becomes very personal with you very quickly, that can be a warning sign, okay? If they mention money, or if they ask for information such as your full name, your address, anything like that, your birth date, okay, they can be looking to, to manipulate you. So just be cautious. And if, if somebody does ask a question that you feel is inappropriate and you set a boundary with them and they become angry or withdraw, that's a sign that that person was looking, had malintentions, okay? So um, if you set boundaries with someone and they don't respect those boundaries, and they try to control you, um, that's a really good sign that you've just protected yourself, right? And even though it can be hurtful, you know, you had this ongoing relationship maybe for a few months with them, and then all of a sudden they start asking for money or something, and you say, no, I'm not gonna give you money, right? Or something along those lines. Um, if they become angry or pushy, or if they withdraw, that's a sign that they didn't have good intentions. So more on dating fraud. So 
You can always look on Action Fraud's website. If you've been a victim of dating fraud or any other type of scan, you can always contact them. Um, if you're ever in doubt about someone, you can also report the person to the dating website you use and you can block them. Um, are they, or the website might even block or bar them from the site, okay, depending on what's going on and how they're, they're acting or if they determine they're making a scam, trying to scam people. So as long as you're aware and follow the tips above, you should be safe and enjoy your online dating experience, okay? If you kiss on the first date, so here's another quote, um, and it's not right, then there will be no second date. Yeah, sometimes it's better to hold out and not kiss for a long time. Um, I'm a strong believer in kissing being very intimate, and the minute you kiss, the floodgates open for everything else. So Jennifer Lopez said that. And really, I, I think she, what she's saying is like, once we open up the emotional floodgates, they can really overpower um, our rational brain. Good to guess, right? We can get very distracted with that, um, that need for that physical connection and all those hormones that start flooding our brain with all those good feelings. So maybe that's something that you want to think about doing, or maybe it's not for you. It's up. It's really, it's up to you, it's your life, right? But um, if you find that um, you get very emotionally connected once you start opening up the, as the physical aspect of a relationship, maybe keeping, holding back on the physical aspect um, until you're more sure about the person can be helpful for you to decide if, if there's someone you want to have more deeply in your life, more involved in your life. So making a new relationship work. So now that you've gone through thinking about dating, doing all the, the prep work um, for being ready to date, um, going through the process of dating other people, and let's say you find someone and you decide you wanna try to make a new relationship work, um, there's a couple, many things to think about, and these are just a few of them. Um, one thing is, Important to keep in mind is we all want different things from relationships, okay? So communicating about that. And it's important not to make assumptions about what the person you're dating is looking for too. Better to ask, don't, don't assume. So while it's usually fairly easy to work out if someone is interested in you, it can be hard to tell if they're looking for a casual relationship or a more serious commitment. And you may not be sure what you're looking for for yourself. Okay? And even just being open and honest about that. I'm not really sure what I'm looking for. I'm not sure if I'm just looking for a friendship or something more. So just talking about that when it gets to the appropriate point. Um, so there's really no magic way of knowing if your relationship will go the distance. Wouldn't that be nice if we just knew that? <laughs> we're, you know, we're, we're always going to respect and be kind to each other even when we disagree. And it's always, and it's going to work out. That, that would be nice to know, but there isn't. So, um, but if you have shared values, plenty in common, can make each other laugh, feel attracted to each other, then there's a good chance of the relationship working. So there's many, many, many dating books and I'm sure information on the internet about um, how to find someone who is a good match for you and, and tips and advice and things to look for checklists, many, many different things and tools that you can find to see what's going to work for you and how you can evaluate if a relationship is right for you. So you have to do some more work. <laughs> Even if you're in the relationship aspect of things, there's always work, but it's, it's for our own good. So check if your dating expectations match up. Some things that you could discuss over time include um, what type of relationship are you looking for at this point? Um, do you want a sexual relationship? What are your sexual expectations? That's really important. Um, what are your hopes for the future? So for some people, they might want to travel. Um, for other people, they might just want to stay in town a lot. Maybe they're helping raise their grandchildren or they want to play a big part in their grandchildren's lives. Um, maybe the person that you're dating has a big involvement in the local community. Um, so these are all important things to say, what, what, is, what is our relationship going to look like? What, how do you see that working out? And all of these things will help you both to work out if you're, if you're compatible and if it's, if it's something that could be a longer term relationship. And also to see if there's going to be the need for any compromises, right? 
and and to think about that what are you willing to compromise and what are you not willing to compromise on right that's really important to know or to figure out as you go along so other topics that you could discuss when you're in a relationship with someone is living together an option so for some people that might be for others it might not be you might be in the relationship but both be really happy in your own homes right there's there's no need to necessarily give up your home to live with someone else okay you decide how what your relationship is going to look like and how it's going to work and what works best for the both of you um, and another big question is if you did decide to live together where would you live so maybe, maybe you've been um, dating someone who lives in another town or maybe they do live in the same town but you both just really like your home so how are you going to figure that out and it can be hard to adjust living to somebody if you've lived on your own for a while or if you've been in a relationship for a long time. Um, if you're both property owners, you'll have to figure out if you're going to live together, what you're going to do with your other home. Um, if you live in different areas, who's going to go to who and what's that going to look like, how you see each other's families, that type of a thing. And so it's important to know that they've done quite a bit of research and some older couples in committed relationships now choose to lose separately for some or all of the week. Maybe, maybe it works for you to spend weekends at um, his home, you spend the weekday at your home, something like that. So there's all different ways to make a relationship work. It's just what, whatever works best for, the, for each of you. And then is marriage something that the other person is looking for? Okay. So for some people, they know right away that they never, never want to try marriage again and for others, maybe that changes over time, or maybe something marriage is something that you really, really would like to have in the future if you found the right person. So that's a, that's a can be an important thing to talk about as you get to know each other better. And then sex in later life. So it is a myth that older people no longer want or need a sex life. So sexuality, our sexuality just doesn't disappear as we get older, and it's perfectly natural to have sexual desires. And a recent report by an English study, um, longitudinal means over time, over a period of time, um, on aging found that two thirds of men and women aged 50 to 90 years old said that sex was an important part of a relationship. Okay, so that's something to definitely take into consideration um, if that's important to you or not and to know whether it is or if it isn't. And they also found in this study that people are still sexually active into their 80s and 90s. Okay. So, um, sex in later life, however, might be different than when you were younger. And it can be especially daunting and intimidating to consider starting a sexual relationship with, some, with a new partner. Um, whether you're divorced or bereaved um, after such a long time or if you're dating for the first time. Okay. So just go slowly. Go Again, follow your feelings, follow, um, you know, just take time to check in with yourself and see what, what, what you want, what works for you, get to know yourself. Um, you or your partner may be experiencing physical changes, which may affect your ability or desire for sex. Um, but getting older doesn't mean giving up on sex, although you may need to make some adjustments. And it's also important to remember that two-thirds of older of adults over age 50 were interested in sex but then there's that one third that weren't as well okay so there's many um where you fall in there that there's many different ranges of that so also it's important to take care of yourself so here are some of some of the same advice applies to when you were young okay so this is just a little refresher so don't you don't ever need to feel that you need to give in to somebody if somebody is pressuring you into doing something that you're not comfortable with sexually financially in any aspect okay it's really important that um, if they're pressuring you they're not respecting you okay if you tell them i'm feeling pressured and they don't back off that is a bad sign so it is not a healthy or safe way to behave and they are creating the problem not you or your feelings okay so please keep that in mind and don't forget to take steps to keep safe and avoid sexually transmitted infections okay so if you're not sure about how to do this you can always talk to your doctor a counselor a good friend and go online and just look at ways to keep yourself physically safe as well 
And that's it basically for today. So um, thank you so much for joining us.